Welcome, welcome, welcome. So welcome for this final discussion session now. I'm so grateful everybody came back. I must make the observation we are lacking Tayloristic work discipline. We overdrew the break, it was too long. But yes, that's how the things are in the natural commons of communications and learning. Um, for this final discussion, we have three members of the Commons Strategies Group, Silke Helfrich, David Bollier, and Michel Bowens. Uh, but before the discussion starts, Silke will actually give a statement which she and David have co-authored. Let me try to make a short introduction. I think it's really a shared feeling that we are at a certain historical moment, and that's characterized by two things. On one hand, a very deep feeling about the insufficiencies of the current mode of development, also known as capitalism, and also um, connected to that, also the observation that capitalism is, going, is undergoing one of its really deep and structural crises, this latest crisis in 2008. It wasn't just another blip on the screen. It's, it's, it's a sign of a deep and structural crisis that this current mode of development is undergoing. At the same time, there's also a shared feeling that maybe the commons holds the key or a key to a solution of this crisis. And that makes, uh, that, that gives really the relevancy of this conference. So, if we look at the, com at the commons not as a sort of slight oddity and a, a survivor of an ancient mode of production, but if we really look at it, what also Stefano Rodotta uh, hinted at, uh, the commons as, as a new design, a new uh, great sort of uh, uh, vision, uh, a common future for all, then... Um, Maybe uh, a good quote from uh, material that David and Silke made uh, available to me, then our challenge is to unleash the potential of the commons through commons enabling infrastructures, laws, platforms and technologies. Those issues lie at the heart of our conference agenda. So to use a German word, which maybe has made it into English as a foreign term, uh, I think what we are also looking at is the real politic of the commons. It's about the real politics of the commons, the actual ongoing commons as a political struggle. And that also means that the commons is a political struggle. So how can this political struggle be won? That's one of the big questions. But there are many other questions, just to name a few. Uh, what does work, uh, labor, mean in a commons economy? Can we imagine whole infrastructures as commons? And which steps are needed for creating legal infrastructures to create the social protocols of self-governing commons, or also maybe not just, uh, or also what in uh, Spanish is buen vivir, or in English uh, conviviality. So, in this respect, I would like to welcome Silke Helfrich. She is an independent author and activist, primary author of the German-speaking Commons blog, co-founder of the Commons Strategies Group, and uh, former head of the regional Heinrich Böll Foundation's office for Central America, Mexico, and Cuba. She engages with activists, academics, business people, and politicians, and travels throughout Europe to explain the strategic value of the Commons. She's also the editor of... Uh, the wealth of the commons beyond market and state. And I know that, she, Silke, you have been working on your statement to the very last second, haven't I, you? I always do, I always do. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, I'm so, unbearable before a speech. Okay. I'll so be then better after. I, I just let you get on with it. <laughs> well, welcome. This is crowded. I remember when we presented the first book, I've edited it in German on the issue five years ago. We presented it right here. Too, too loud? Okay. Um, there was Andreas Weber as a commentarist, and he said, I don't understand why it's not crowded. So five <laughs> years later, <laughs> it's a little bit more crowded, actually. We had to um, manage consensus, con consci con conscientiously access um, to that conference. Uh, and, and, and we felt 
and feel, and it will be, I guess, a shared feeling after this conference that next time we try to gather an uncommon conference, an uncommon conference on the commons, we try to do it in a really open movement congress style. Um, my talk today, as Armin already said, uh, has been prepared uh, with, with my dear colleague and fellow commoner, David Bollier from Amherst, Massachusetts, and shared in ideation uh, as well with, with um, Michelle Bowens, who both will share um, after, after the talk this uh, space with me to engage into a discussion with you. And we thought that a good way to start was asking that question I'm quite sure you're very familiar with, right? That, that many people ask you, oh, the comments, how, how do you get to the comments? And then you start saying, you know, that's quite a tricky thing and it, it needs kind of a long answer. And the good news is that's not quite true because I can show you a shortcut. You just travel to Colchester in the United Kingdom, take train 68 and go right to the commons. <laughs> well, if that shortcut doesn't work, you might rely on some of the um, products and initiatives, publications and books and projects that came out of a real eruption throughout the last five to ten years on the commons, based on the very idea of the commons all over the world. And, um, and, and sometimes then people say, well, but that's not a new thing, that's quite old style. There was already reference to this idea. And we say, yes, that's true. But we have to try to grasp the very heart of the commons idea and adapt it to our circumstances, our societies and our times. So indeed, the commons like this example it's the famous pieces du Canton du Valais in Switzerland. First half of the century, they were built by very brave Swiss mountain people. And they are part of a very sophisticated irrigation system in the Swiss mountains, which enabled people to bring the water directly from the glaciers to the villages and to the farms. And they are still working today. It's a quite famous illustration of how long-lasting commons institutions may be. Actually, the commons as institutions are older than any state uh, has been in the world so far. And uh, moving back to modern times, these are the Great Lake comes across border grassroots effort to establish the Great Lake lakes as a commons and legally protected by a region. This is an initiative catalyzed by a network of commons activists in the United States called On the Commons. You surely know some of the On the Commons are here and share this conference with us, and they do it in close partnership with indigenous people. It's still in its early stages. I mean, think only of the dimension of what we are talking about when we are talking about the Great Lakes region. And they aspire to build a diverse array of participation and advocacy to remake the policy governance for the endangered Great Lakes. This one is one of my favorite examples. I don't know if you're familiar with. If not, just go to, to YouTube and look for the tech talk uh, from one of his, its incubators. His name is Cesar Harada. And he came out of the MIT and he was really very concerned with the oil spills uh, from BP in, in, um, um, in the Pacific Ocean, right? In the Gulf of Mexico. And, in, and then he wondered why is it that high tech, which is so costly, is so inefficient in cleaning our oceans from oil spill? And then he started in a trial and error way, building up an open source project, building up an international community, and designing, just look at this, I like this image, because it shows like they, they reshaped the boat. Boats had always the same form throughout human history, right? And now they, 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 they actually, in their experimentation, it led them to reshape the boat so that it now looks like a spin. That is why now it is so flexible and it's much more efficient in cleaning 
our oceans from oil spills. It's an open source, international community-based um, project that, that connects this high-tech world to the, to the actual ecological dramas we are facing. Back to South Africa. This is a meeting of um, the Kakula Hedis, <clears throat> of the bush buck rich in South Africa. They are called <laughs> bush buck, it's so interesting. The fir first U is an U and the second U is an A. Oh, okay, forget about it. They are a collective of over 300 uh, healers from two provinces in South Africa. The, m the meeting and this photo was held to discuss the pooling of their knowledge and resources. Last year, I had the opportunity to travel to Croatia, and I was aware of a, a really sprawling, vital urban commons movement where activists and people from the academia try to kind of reinvent and reshape urban space as a commons, especially in those conflict region, regions which are mapped out here in Croatia. Another interesting example is that different hackerspaces or technophile projects connect to the commons idea, like the embassy of the commons in Poland or the Hack for Good initiative from Spain, where they explicitly try to reconnect to ecological purposes as well. Or you may have a look at the manifesto of the Fab Lab movement. Obviously, not all Fab Lab spaces have this kind of political dimension, but at least in Germany, the, the Fab Lab São Pauli in Hamburg explicitly has, it is based on the very idea of the commons, or the Move Commons, which is a tagging system for internet content and project that helps to identify and support commons-based projects. You'll find it uh, down here in the space of Commonopolis during the conference. LibreOffice which I guess at least 90% of those who are in the room use on their computers and their institutions as well, or at least, or at least um, the, 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 the project they reshape and they took over because LibreOffice, Libre it's, it's an interesting effort throughout the last two years. The community successfully took back a software product that was bought by Oracle, by a company, and this former software product was open office. And it was taken over by, by Oracle and then controlled by trademarks and domain names. And they were still working with open source office. But even so, it was very hard to really get it back under the control of community. And now uh, that's the difference between open office and libre office. Or the Masipak project in the Philippines and beyond the frontiers of Philippines, which is a kind of seed breeding on-farm iteration process based really on the needs of the farmers, on the, query, or on the very question, what kind of seed is adapted to our conditions? What kind of seed is adapted to our needs? How can we control as farmers and users the seed breeding process? which in our time seems to be is more and more concentrated in the hand of big companies. And so the very interesting thing on, of this project is they, they, they rename the varieties they breed together on farm. And, and the way they rena rename it allows them to avoid the national law on seed control. So they don't need to deal with all this issue of um, it's not patent yeah patenting uh, in order to get market access for seeds because it's not about market access it's about creating and breeding together and developing together the best seeds for our needs. Or another part of this eruption is the eruption of kind of educational uh, and learning projects on the commons. My colleague. Um, Brigitte Kratzwald and I, we, we convened last time, last year for the first time, the Common Summer School in a, a small village in, in the south of Thuringia. And um, 
similar efforts are going on. This, the, the, the next one is the logo from the School of Commoning in London. Or, as I already shared with you, I had the opportunity to be at the Korean Academy in West in Croatia, where people from, I guess, 16 countries from Eastern Europe were invited to, well, learn together collectively, share knowledge on the commons or the free technology academia, which is an, a, a project that serves to the global community in a way, but I guess it's based in Spain, right? Walter Terence is here, who is one of the main collaborators of that project. The Digital Commons, was, which has been one of the first conferences convened by a school for the commons in Barcelona. And all those initiatives are really, really young. It's really an eruption going on. Uh, uh, this kind of projects, uh, people usually connect to the commons, like um, the Guasa area and the highlands of Ethiopia, which is managed by the men's community as common property resource. It can be used for grazing, etc. so for the, for, the, for the needs for food and shelter and livestock breeding of the community. It's, it's more than 400 years old. Uh, as I said, some institutions of the commons tend to be really resilient because they are adaptive to changing circumstances. And this one already, Stefano Rodotà reminded us that we have to look at the processes going on in Italy, which is certainly the country in Europe where the commons discourse is, is, is really kind of penetrating the public debate uh, massively um, also in Germany, it's uh, at least I, I, on my radar, there are, are different discourses going on also in starting in political parties, but Italy is definitely the country where this dynamic is kind of most visible. And one of its examples is this is, uh, is Na Naples, the city of Naples. This is just a symbol for the conversion of a private company to manage the water supply for people to a public common partnership to manage the water supply of the city. And, and I would say, as Tommaso Fattori, who is also here in the room, um, used to, to name it, this is a, big, a, a great example for that idea of the commonification of public services. So even experimentation on that level of the commonification of public services is going on. Or you might know Wikispeed, which is quite famous as well. A 100 mile per gallon car, actually it's a race car, using processes borrowed from the software world. It's, it's actually, it's very lean. It has been developed by 150 people based on the use of free um, um, communication and development tools in the internet. And, and it's sometimes hard to imagine that one can produce cars the same way as free software can produce, but one can. So this is one of the products that comes out of the whole open hardware um, community. And it's now challenging the way production of industrial-style production of modern lifestyle artifacts have been conceived until today. We go again to the south, to the Potato Park in Peru, a legally recognized indigenous biocultural heritage area in which indigenous people are the designated stewards of a region known for its hundreds of varieties of potatoes. You may know that we have kind of 7,000 varieties of potatoes and in the world, and the only way to really steward for them is to continue growing them, cultivating them. So that's what these people do for us. Um, and this is a project in Leipzig where young people, young commoners, they, they have a core idea around this. And around this core idea, they named their project. The core idea is... We don't want a slice of the cake. We want a whole bakery. So the project is called the whole bakery. Die ganze Bäckerei. Commoners bake bread together and share it based on individual needs. And, and interestingly, also they say, we only use the equipment and the infrastructure we can support 
ourselves. We won't use more infrastructure than we can commonly support ourselves. So that's an idea of non-debt dependency. And finally, again, back to Italy. Look at this wonderful old theater at the very heart of the capital of Italy, Rome, <laughs> which is the Teatro Valle itself claimed as a commons. And just a month ago, a bit more than a month ago, they held a Constituente Beni Comuni, uh, a kind of symbolic, of course, constitutional assembly on the commons to think about how law and politics and the state could be reshaped based on the commons idea. And just look at, look at this picture. It's, it's really packed. And in front of there is Stefano Rodota, one of the leading, leading figures of that, of that debate. So Sisyphus starts his training in the Netherlands with a styrofoam rock. Whenever somebody asks you, how do we go to the commons, give them a styrofoam rock to start making. And this is what we want to start with uh, in the second, which is the conceptual part of this call. Exactly, I'm done with this. That is the question, what do all these projects have in common? What does all this mean? Are these projects and the ideas behind them truly related? Is there a shared something in these examples that really could be a basis for a larger movement? It is easy to say that there is a commons movement out there, but it's sometimes difficult to put it in short terms and really figure out what helps this larger movement together? What is the social glue, so to say, between a fab lab and the hackerspace and the Embassy of Commons in Poland and the Masipak project in the Philippines? So we believe there is something that all these projects share and that, I, that identifying, crystallizing it, will help us overcome the crisis of political vision. The political exhaustion and fearful short-term approaches that always keeps us in the either or box, either market or state, either public or private, either doctor or patient, either teacher or pupil, either nature or culture. So our challenge here at the conference, our challenge at the Commons Movement, and especially our challenge as Commons Strategies Group, of course, is to make sense of this enormous diversity and develop to a relation to develop the relationship among all these what we call commons. Robustness and coherence within the commons can fill an incredible void in our political and cultural imagination. As far as I can see, actually. There is no credible alternative vision, nor within the more official political system, like think about the programs of political parties in your country, nor among political movements. There are obviously, and, and, and Maristella brought it to our attention, highly appreciated approaches to this. But there's always a struggle, for instance, at the World Social Forum, where I often participate, to give coherence to, the, to them. Many, many, many of these approaches are or defensive or fragmented or narrowly focused. And the very problem with this is not that they are or fragmented or defensive or narrowly focused. The pr very problem with that is that the world around us is strategically very well positioned. In other words, market fundamentalism is everywhere. It is the default norm for all conversations in economics, policy, and politics. And this is just a symptom of fear and a symptom of lack of imagination. The idea, it's this symptom of the very idea that we need a kind of blueprint. The more liberals tend to blueprint market-based solutions and the more kind of left test think about the blueprints of 
kind of state-based redistributional solutions. So this ethos and worldview actually has penetrated into the deepest and most remote corners of our lives and livelihoods. Enclosures, prioritizations, exploitation of natural resources, financialization, land grabbing, etc., etc., are everywhere. And for me, at least as a political person, the worst thing of it is that those enclosures get really legal support and legal push and legal framing. One of the examples uh, I'm, uh, I'm most, of, most, of, most familiar with because I've been living in Latin America for quite a while, and uh, well, as you can understand, NAFTA started there in 1994, uh, so we had NAFTA, AFTA, SEFTA, SIFTA, GAFTA, na, uh, SAFTA, TAFTA. <laughs> well, that, that's the way they call it, and they call it economic integration. When, it's, when it is quite a bit off, neo-extractivism and disintegr social disintegration, taking space and freedom to the people to manage their own resources because they have to be exported without barriers to the other country. So, and the other problem is that the most sophisticated and dangerous dimension of, the, is, of, of all this is the market fundamentalization of our minds. So people tend to think first and foremost in terms of, of markets. Of, like, they even tend to think about themselves as, as what is my unique selling point? Right? What is my exchange value on the market? Do I have a business model for my project? Can I capitalize my skills and knowledge? Instead of asking, does something make sense to human well-being or to put it in the words of Andreas Weber again, does it enliven us? The only question that anyone seems to ask is, how can I make money out of it? And our, our language that way, we accepted those concepts of the market in our language, and that way our language became a straight jacket. And it is, as Stefano Rodotà pointed out in the last session, Language is performative. In other words, it makes reality and it shapes the way we think. So let's name it, as our friends in Latin America, America used to do the colonialization of our minds and of our language within a marketized world. And yet, the good news is, because I decided, if there is a bad news, we have to think about it, put all our energy and looking at the opportunities in it, the pride side of it, looking at the solutions and how we can get them out of the mess. So the good news is that market fundament fundamentalism is just an idea. It's a mindset. That is, we can challenge it with other ideas and with another mindset. We can bypass, hack, or undermine the market state duopoly which is based on market fundamentalism mindset. And we can challenge it, and that is our belief and our guess in common strategies group, with a coherent concept of the commons. And to do so, we also need to demarketize our vocabulary and to commonify our minds. So the commons is both a core idea for a fairer and free world and as we have seen in the first part of the presentation, a wide range of social practices that help us meet our needs. And before I start digging deeper into the, the issue you all want to hear about, you all want to hear about economics and the commons, because that's the way the conference is, is named, right? And there has to be a reason for it. But before I start digging deeper into that, well, let me explain four short conceptual points on the commons. First of all, the commons, this has been said again and again and again and again, and still repetition is the master of our minds. The commons is not a resource, but a process. For example, that sentence of water is a commons, well, I don't know how, much, how many times I've written that same sentence in my blog posts or articles. I don't do it anymore. Because the, the sentence, water is a commons, is actually a bit weird. 
what it can or must be converted into a commons. And that's the very challenge, because actually we know that water perfectly can be converted into a commodity, like bottled water to be sold in the supermarket. So the very question for us is, it, is how can we convert water into a commons? And it all depends on the decisions we make and the actions we take. Being a commons is nothing intrinsic to a good. It is more about us and our relationships to the goods as we manage shared resources. So we suggest to slightly switch that kind of core definition to the commons to a sentence that already has been introduced in Barbara's talk at the opening of the conference, to always keep in mind that every commons is a social commons. We suggest as a focal point for commons identity and culture to focus on the process of commoning and not on the resource. There is no commons without commoning, as Peter Limbo, the US historian, brilliantly put out. Okay, no manifestations, everybody see. seems to agree with that. Wonderful. If there's no protest in the room, I assume that everybody agrees. <laughs> Second suggestion. I think that the common categorization of the commons needs an upgrade. This one is a little more tricky and, and more difficult to assume than, than the former, I, I believe. By commons categories, common categorization of the commons, we mean that idea of there's the natural commons or the material commons on one side and the cultural commons and digital commons on the other side. And in a way, I think this is a crutch because it is somehow easier to think about a commons as a thing instead of seeing its deeper reality as a social relationship and a social process. So, from a political and strategic perspective, I know that this distinction is useful in some cases. For instance, if you want to define access rules, it is useful. But there's certainly agreement to that, that managing access or defining access rules to water is one thing and access rules to knowledge is another thing because water gets less when we share it and knowledge gets more when we share it. But at a deeper level, at a political, strategic level, at a conceptual level, it is very difficult to think about the natural commons on one hand and the cultural commons on the other hand. And the most important reason for that is, is, is quite simple, it's analytical. Every commons has a material basis. It always, always relies on the earth resources and on the, on the real work of people, the care we have to take for them. You'll never find a pure knowledge commons. All of them are based on a material layer. All of them need energy. And even geeks need food. And vice versa. The so-called natural commons are not separable from the knowledge that is needed to manage and steward them. Actually, I guess that the most traumatic side effect, and this certainly speaks to those of you who deal with biodiversity issues, the most traumatic side effect of the so-called enclosure of the commons is that people forget how to collectively manage a complex natural resource system. That is why this, for instance, this is the global seed vault in Svalbard, and the permanent ice of Svalbard. It isn't enough to protect our cultural heritage, the enormous variety of millions and millions of seeds. Because in there, our plant varieties are disconnected from the knowledge and the skills to actually cultivate them and to make use out of it. And this knowledge cannot adapt, it cannot further develop. So it's a vicious circle. People just unlearn, they forget the social practices which are at the very heart of the commons. So please remember, let's see if we agree on that. Every commons is a knowledge commons. Third idea. There are only four. And then we go to the issue that is really interesting for you, economics and the commons. Every commons needs protection. 
or I also like to call it that idea of beyond openness. Because I think that the idea of access is usually overstated, both by the traditional left and by the open access movement, and by Jeremy Rifkin, of course. An access rule in a commons is a means to an end. It's a mean to make sure that there is fairness in the commons. That is why, as I said, we have limited access to natural resources and free access, open access, to non-rivalrous resources. It is just a rule to guarantee that we can all benefit from the logic of abundance of knowledge and ideas and code. But, and here's the point, Openness does not guarantee that things will remain open, as we have seen in the LibreOffice Oracle example, or as we can see in Google Books. The problem is that we tend to look at the rules instead of the underlying principles. And we should really wonder if the commons should unconditionally be open to everyone, including the enclosures. So the same way we have to protect a source of fresh water, putting access and use limits for the commonwealths, we also have to protect the idea of free knowledge. And we need to invent institutions and protection mechanisms so that free knowledge will really be free and stay free also in the future and cannot re be reappropriated by enclosures or for market purposes. And both ideas, the beyond knowledge and um, uh, the each commons is a knowledge commons and the beyond openness idea, imply not to build a commons concept and framework on resource categories which is actually a kind of economistic habit. It's a habit that is symptomatic for the ontology, for a worldview that objectifies everything. Our suggestion is, in very general terms, that we base the concept of the commons, the definition of the commons, and the short descriptions we always have to deliver to the journalists, etc., on the principles of commoning. Every commons need protection. Remember that. And the last point in this part of the talk is how can we stay, scale up? Do you know that question? How can we scale up? Sounds familiar to you? So, and, and then at a certain point, I always was nervous about that question. Sometimes I even get angry, even in a public conference. And then at a, at a given moment, I said, okay, isn't, I wondered if, if isn't that scaling up idea itself an expression of hierarchical thinking. Isn't the challenge to go beyond scale and to go at a level of principles and patterns and to look for the patterns of the social processes of commoning all over the world, if they are common and shared patterns, if the way we relate to each other in a hackerspace, um, five minutes? Hope you stand more. Okay. Um, but I want to hear about the principles of common space economy. Okay. Um, so uh, we were talking about the scaling up thing, right? And if you want to scale up, um, exactly, make our minds up on what what is behind that very question. If it's not hierarchical thinking, and if we should not switch to another more important question to look at the very principles of the way we relate to each other and if there are common patterns between, say, a fab lab and the Masik Pak project in the Philippines. Because we think that commons are not built from bottom up or from top down. They are peer to peer. They expand horizontally. Let me put this into an image. Commons are densely interconnected with each other. Almost and almost inevitably, a network leads to the emergence 
of new system features, of new characteristics of the system that emerges out of that connection. And out of the interplay of the individual components, new characteristics of the system will emerge that had have not been visible in the components before. So emergence is actually a key notion in complex social systems. And therefore, our thesis says that, to put it bluntly, the commons does not scale up, but rather slowly crystallizes like atoms in a crystal lattice of society. So imagine that newcomers, newcomers like those atoms, can come from all sides and add to the crystal and grow it towards all directions. That this, this process of growing, you can see it here, it's, it's not top-down, it's expanding towards all directions. Without, and that's the interesting thing, leaving traces of new hierarchies or new points of centralization. That way, small changes, commons by commons, can have big effects on the whole system. There is no linear change because the commons, like crystals, grow towards all directions, like, and that's the subtitle of our, conferences, of our conference, from seed form to core paradigm. Thus, we invite you not to be obsessed with scaling and to focus instead on the integrity of what we have and how to help expand it. We know that the human species has developed through cooperation and that the problem is that many of our institutions, actually laws and infrastructures, undermine this very idea of cooperation and give a stimulus for competition to compete each other. So those issues of how can we help expanding cooperation and the very logic and patterns at the heart of the commons are at the very heart of this conference. How can we come from the small initiatives I showed at the beginning, from those seed forms to the core paradigm, talking about the infrastructures, the way we work in the commons, the way we conceive management of, of natural resources and knowledge, and the way we understand meaning and spirituality in the commons. That makes the agenda of our program. I know that I'm officially finished, but I have to share a last part of my talk, which is another suggestion, which is an important one. Because you might be all familiar with um, this Harvard professor, Jochai Bengler, who has coined the term based on his research on how networks actually work of common space peer production. So in a little ambition of us, we suggest to go beyond common space peer production. Also the reason for that is very simple because actually we think that each economy, whatever, socialist, capitalist, whatever economy, it's based on the commons, right? In a double sense, it uses shared resources and it relies on processes of commoning. So if we now consider the commons as something more than a resource, as we agreed upon before, if we think about them as productive and generative social systems, then a, con uh, a commons cannot solely be commons-based. It has to first and foremost produce social trust, reciprocity, and cooperation. And in terms of products, because if we say that the commons is a productive process, there's something very concrete coming out of it, like the bread in the whole bakery, or the free software instead of Microsoft or Apple. So the commons as the products themselves, the, the products coming out of this productive and generative social process of the commons should be commons themselves, first and foremost, and not commodities. So it is crucial that a project, initiative, or a society must produce first and foremost commons and not just commodities as a focal point of its economy. Because commons enable and encourage 
people to continue relating to each other in non-exclusive terms. Or in other words, we're talking about a relational economy and not just a transactional economy. And that is precisely the way we try to frame the conference to think about how can infrastructures, labor, work, and care, natural resources, etc., be reframed from a commons perspective or in relational terms? How can we actually contribute to what we would call a commons creating peer economy? And here are, and I'm, all, I'm about to finish, six short principles of that commons creating peer economy. First of all, I guess you know that guy. That's not new at all. And it has been shared not only by Marxists. So, yeah, I think I've been at least, what was her name again? Haha. <laughs> yeah, he had not, he had, she had not quite a good time at home. Um, but he had a very good idea, uh, which is um, use value trumps exchange, exchange value. And this was confirmed by both of our keynote speakers this morning. The co-focus on the commas is on how is it useful to our everyday lives versus how can we sell it for money. Next principle, I guess you also know that guy. This is Disney, and, and Disney has been quite active in the fairy tale common, which is nice because we all have, we all are, and we all should do and enjoy them. And then he made a bunch of products out of it. And the very question is, what did he give back to the commons? So that is the answer. Until today, nothing at all. So one of the very principles that actually they sue, they sue people if they use the way Disney reshaped Snow White. So one of the principles um, Walt Disney did not really respect, to be polite with him, was is that he or she who takes from the commons has to contribute to the commons. But this contribution can be delinked both in time and quantity. Or in other words, instances of giving and taking are structurally delinked in a commons. We call this indirect reciprocity. Third principles, principle, and there are, there are only six of them, Self-organization and self-healing. So commoning arises from specific opportunities to create together or from specific collective concerns about how to resolve a problem. So the group or community or network can assign distributed responsibilities so that there is an oversight of the performance of these several roles, but there are the many structural interdependencies make it very difficult to create new power positions or dogmas. So that is at least, it, it is not a guarantee. But the way the interconnection, the structural interconnection within the next work, networks works makes it more difficult to get it, to get it centralized, to get it, um, people in a power position. Fourth idea, free knowledge and what we would call white technology. So adapted technology, people can actually use, share, analyze, reproduce, repair, etc. All those things we cannot do, not even with the motor block of our car, right? So share what you can, especially knowledge, information, and code is really key to the commons. And sharing of free knowledge, free information, and code does not mean free as in free beer, it means non-discriminatory access and having and defending and protecting the right to share so that everyone can freely contribute his knowledge and skills to the commons. Beating the bounds is one of the ways commoners used in the 17th century to protect their commons. It was a kind of community festival 
that people were walking around, identifying together during the walk, the last enclosures, and just taking off, digging off the fences again. So, that was a way of resistance, organized basically as a community festival. So what we, what we need today, as I said, each commons needs protection, is we would need to look for a modern day equivalence of the beating the bounds idea and tradition. And the last principle of a commons creating peer economy is iteration. That means basically that we start planning something based on the needs and problems a community or a group of users has. We design a system and a solution, implement it and so, ever, and, and, and so on and so forth, and test it on the field, on the ground, on the farm, like the Mazipak people did with their seed breeding. So robust commons institutions are most likely to find protective solutions through trial and error, tolerance for mistakes, and ongoing reflection. And just, and just to share with you two very short examples that I can tell you that this is not utopia. This is done in the real world. The first example is the open source ecology. People from open source ecology are here with us. They designed a kind of global village construction set uh, where uh, I guess it's 50 machines we would use to reproduce our modern livelihoods are designed the same way the open sailing boat of Protea introduced to you is designed. Where every step is documented in the internet, is freely shared. Everybody can contribute to this design process. So a sawmill, a bakery machine, a tractor, and obviously, but you, you would need it if you would like to grow your own food, right? And, and, and not doing the same way we did it 2,000 years ago. So, and, and the interesting thing on that is also that um, it is how our dear friend Wolfgang Sachs uses to say money efficient. In other words, we would need much less money to produce this kind of commons instead of the other one a product, a commodity, to sell it on the market. And my second and last example is Sequesa Sola, and I'm extremely pleased to have three people from Sequesa Sola from Venezuela here, which is a 43 years old project, Construyendo Juntos Relaciones de Confianza. But at the very heart of it is that idea that it's all about constructing trust, trustful relationships among people which is a hard, communication-intensive, problem-intensive process. But it does work in the case of Sikosesola, which is a big, big, big cooperative, feeding 40,000 people, if I'm well informed, and doing it based on a completely different logic than the market logic, and thus staying on the same market. So it is, it is very interesting, and I invite you to, to read what has been written on Seco Sola uh, lately here in Germany, because they are on a tour in Germany, and to benefit from the conference to know them. That is at the very heart of a commons creating peer economy, foster relationship and not transactions. Thank you. Thank you, Silke, for this great speech. And I would like to ask now David and Michelle to, to join us here. Um, let me just, I take this one. I'm sitting there, yeah. David Bollier is an international active independent scholar and activist on the Commons. He has pursued his calling as an author, blogger, and ad hoc collaborator since the late 1990s. He's one of the co-founders of the Commons Strategies Group, but he has also pursued this uh, idea in other uh, areas. So he also co-founded the Commons Law Project in uh, 2010, 
and um, he also is the author of 12 books um, and of course he is also uh, writing his blog and upgrading it as often as possible on bollier.org. Michel also, maybe I hardly need to introduce him to many people here. He is the co-founder, no, he's the founder of the P2P Foundation. So uh, they, uh, Michel's idea is the peer-to-peer -peer society, and he has also been very relentless in uh, talking about his ideas, traveling, writing constantly. Um, he is also teaching at Payab University and Chiang Mai University. He's writing or has been writing a blog on English Al Jazeera. So that's very interesting also that those ideas are entering into other regions. Um, I would like to make this session as interactive as possible, also involving you. Um, uh, but I think uh, at this point, maybe a first reaction is due from either David or Michel, who likes to go first, should go first, as your sort of uh, your response to this talk by Silke. Well, <coughs> uh, yes, uh, I perhaps should not, I should defer to Michel since some of my thoughts were reflected in, in Silke's remarks, and then I'd love to have a conversation with the rest of you. So, Michelle, why don't you, if you have things to add now or... or I'd rather wait for questions. Okay. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay, then we're going straight to questions. Straight to questions. Questions. Uh, here we are. Comments. Com comments also. <laughs> maybe another principle should be to say who you are, maybe. We should have introduced that much earlier. Yes, please. Hi, uh, Max Holland, anthropologist. Um, I'd be interested to know what you think the role of organized violence was historically in the break breakup of commons practices and networks and the trust that you talked about as being essential. Okay. It, was, it, was, it was critical. Uh, violence was essential to the breakup of the commons uh, throughout history, and we see it today with the criminalization of piracy and all sorts of, and, and it was, as we heard earlier with Maristella, with the criminalization of protest. And uh, so violence is critical to the enforcement of so-called free markets. Yes, um, I think this is one of the reasons that I actually... I think the digital commons are so important because the traditional commons, of course, they have been existing for thousands of years, but they have been really under threat. And I, I think objectively they are retreating. Um, I think maybe now there's a bit of a revival, but um, I think this is what's interesting about digital commons is that we they are growing. And so here we have a field where uh, people are actually recreating commons within the current system. And, you know, what you create, you love and you want to defend. So I think that we are actually in the process of creating new commons institutions that are designed to defend these new commons and, um, and then can also then infuse that kind of experience back again to the uh, traditional commons and learn from them, of course, as a cycle. So I think they're both... Uh, very much related to each other, but I think the um, we we can learn a lot uh, in in our time from how digital commons are consolidating their existence and defending uh, you know their own expansion. And I think you know we have to think about capital accumulation. That's the current system. We have to think about commons accumulation, which is happening, but we also have to think about what I would call cooperative accumulation, which is you know, how the people who work for the commons can make a living and create sustainable livelihoods outside of capital accumulation. This is still kind of a missing area. And I think that the important thing here is that we have to think about is the conversions and the synthesis of the social economy, the solidarity economy, the cooperative economy, um, which is, you know, it rests on Z ethical pr uh, premises, with the emergence of peer production and the open uh, methods. And I think it's the combination of those two things 
which will allow us to, a, to project power and counter power to that violence which has destroyed the traditional commons. <laughs> the mic is the only non-comments in the room. Um, yeah, so um, I'm, I'm Andreas Weber. I'm a, um, um, a cultural uh, scientist and a biologist and a book author and, um, and um, a commoner, actually, I know. And, um, well, I'm, I'm, as always, I'm intrigued by your talk. And as, as you told uh, the audience, I've been here five years ago. Um, and I'm always intrigued by your talks and also by the way they evolve. And so somehow, I, actually, I am all, I'm also intrigued by the way the politicians evolve, which I hear because five years ago there was also a politician. And it's also this, yes, yes, sorry. Um, no, no, it's, uh, but I, I wanted to say that um, I, I will talk about um, commons principles and the way to general, generalize them. But I, I just wanted to point um, that um, what, you, what you did here, um, you, you could also, you could put to, to, to different frames. So I will talk about um, a perspective of um, well, life or bi biology, but what I see here is that you, you could also describe relationships with what you used. Like um, um, indirect reciprocity, sharing. So in a way, we go far from um, this political or technical description to something which is quite deep and quite general. And I think this this is this is what is exciting me in a way, because so we we arrive at a layer of description of reality which becomes. Uh, not only a kind of third-person description, but which we can also share as beings. And I think this is also a commoning process. So it's, um, I think it's, I'm, I'm impressed. Thank you very much. Um, maybe I think we take this as a note, maybe some responses to that later, yeah? Um, I think here at, oh, he, uh, sorry, here please, yeah. He was already trying to say something earlier. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, David always reminds Could me that... Could you please say who you oh, are? Oh, Richard Rosen uh, from the TELUS Institute. I work on uh, energy uh, systems issues mostly. But I think David correctly, and Silky certainly did in the talk, r reminds us that commoning should be conceived of a process. And again, I'm behind the eight ball here, but, you know, like if we had one kind of commons in a community, say, around water, I can sort of imagine how the process might occur. But if in, say, a particular community or region, each individual is part of a big process which might involve many aspects of society, water, food, you know, energy resources, you name it, it seems to me commoning would involve a major reorganization of how society is structured and particularly how decisions, political decisions are made. Could, could you comment on that? Would you like immediately? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Would you like to Maybe. Yeah. My name is George Poor. I'm with the School of Common Inc. from London. I appreciated very much this new and quite radical thought, new to me at least, that uh, every economy is based on the commons, which is kind of dull, kind of evident, but uh, having heard uh, articulated like that uh, brings up some interesting questions, uh, particularly around uh, Silke's other statement, which, if I recall, was something like, uh, if it is so, then, of course, uh, products uh, should be also commons and not commodities. Uh, 
And uh, of course, I, I totally agree with that. And the question that uh, all this leads to me is, um, what do you guys think or have some insight or some intuition about what can be or what are or what can be the commons enabling infrastructures in the area of uh, capitalist production. I mean, what will happen to the big corporations? What we, are, what we hear a lot and uh, is focusing on the positive uh, examples of uh, commons outside the, the traditional com uh, production system. And that also makes a lot of sense because, uh, well, one can say that don't fight the darkness, better, better light a candle. So let's uh, create the, the new instead of focusing uh, on the old world that is dying. But it's unlikely that the own old world will really die without a significant push from us. So that's why I'm asking... <laughs> That's why I'm asking, what, uh, what do you think about what could be the commons enabling infrastructures inside the corporation that would uh, help the transition towards uh, work as commons? I'll take one more question from here. Yep. And then I think we have a lot to talk about. We had a question yesterday you say, you say about the digital commons and the commons... Could you please say who you are? We said oh, I'm Heiner Banking. Okay. Uh, we had a question yesterday about uh, the digital commons and the commons of the eco-communities. So I wonder how we can make that concrete because the final question is who owns the commons, who protects the commons... And who shares what is beyond the commons? And can we, as we try to sum up in Rio after 92, can we come to common frames of references? And maybe that is a new quality of commons. Okay, I think we have collected enough. Um, there was first Andreas, uh, which was more like an extended comment congratulating to the change in syntax and direction would you like to well uh, yes but while he did, while andreas didn't ask a specific question i think he pointed to something rather profound which is that the commons gives us a way to reclaim our subjectivity and intersubjectivity as a valid important aspect of production and creating society in that it unlike technocratic solutions which uh, presume a certain objectivity and we're all fungible units in a cog known as the economy or cogs in the system known as the economy uh, the subjectivity of the commons I think is its engine and its uh, heartbeat and uh, I think that's something worth pausing on because I think it's part of helping us reclaim our humanity in the face of a lot of larger systems that uh, don't really care about our humanity. Then there was a question about the commoning as a process, which also imagined uh, involved a major reorganization. Would you maybe, yeah? This is a bit of a complex uh, question, um, but I'll, I'll give you my analysis of what the problem is today. Um, you know, when, when we say that every production is commons based, uh, that is true, but of course there are modes of of capitalism that destroy the commons, that enclose the commons, but there's also modes of capitalism now that actually create commons. And free software is a very good example because IBM works with Linux and is creating more Linux. So we have a very paradoxical situation. And so the situation for me is that we have a commons accumulation in terms of use value. But for the commoners themselves, they're still obliged to sell their labor and function within capital accumulation. And this is, for me, the key uh, that we have to change. So how can we find modes of operation 
that allow the commoners to create new types of vehicles that can create sustainable livelihoods for the commoners working for the commons. Now, I have, I have a potential uh, solution to this, which is a bit one of the principles that uh, Silke uh, used which, when she said that that commons should not be free for people who do not contribute to the commons. So I'm proposing that commoners should use new types of licenses that actually say, if you're not contributing to the commons, then you pay. <coughs> and this would create a stream of exchange value from capital to the commoners. This is one, one uh, solution. The second is that commoners should create not-for-profit uh, entities. So in other words, where the social goal of the co-op or the fair trade organization or whatever legal means they use is actually to strengthen the commons so that you are actually legally and structurally as an entity uh, in reinforcing the commons. And then the answer to your question, George, is that this is how you build power. You know, once you are autonomous and independent of the mainstream system, you can build a counterpower. And this is what's missing today. The counterpowers that we have is a labor movement. And it's, in the West, at least, is declining because we are deproletarizing. So it's declining. And we are exactly in the same situation as the 19th century where the knowledge workers who are precarious and are creating the, these commons have to start organizing again their mutualities and all kinds of entities that create a social fabric which can sustain new type of social and political movements. Of course, in alliance with the old ones, but we know that it's no longer enough to have labor movements uh, to change our society. We need to build commons-based social and political movements, but they have to be based on something <coughs> real, which is the, actually, the actual power of these commons-producing social organization. And it's the, for me, that's the answer. It's, that's why it's never a technical answer. It's never just social. It always has to be you know, technological, social, and political at the same time. Michel, that was very efficient. You answered two questions in one. Fantastic. Silke wants to say something. Uh, yeah, I don't want to answer a question, but, but I would just challenge one remark towards me uh, when he said that uh, uh, we presented pretty much uh, examples from outside the traditional production system. And I would like to challenge that remark. Uh, well, um, they are outside of the box thinking, but I have to develop those initiatives and, and seed germ forms of, of commons to produce commons within the system, and that is precisely the, the, the difficulty. So I could not really explain how open source ecology works, and it does not make sense because we have people from o open source ecology here, or we, it could not really explain how Sequestra Solar works. But I was really intrigued by how they um, buy in, you know, how marketized our language is, how they... Um, take to their hearts the very idea of producing commons. Just one example. In, and how they, for instance, switch their idea, the logic of scarcity, to a logic of abundance in the case of food production. Just imagine you go to the market tomorrow and you'll find spargel in English? Asparagus. 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 Asparagus and spinach at the same price a kilo. Well, that's what Sequoia Solar does. So the idea is, what do we need to contribute to produce the food we need? And the, the food they actually produce and put on the market is not related to that, that idea of Scarcity, the more scarcer, the higher the price. It's really sold to the same price per kilo each product. And the very question for Sequestra Sola seems to be, and I, I, I could not identify where you are. I guess you are somewhere in the room. Oh, hi. <laughs> Welcome. Bienvenidos. Um, is, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is, well, what do we need? How do we have to develop 
trustful relationships, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to continue producing what we need to make a living in such a way that everybody gets what he needs and that we don't have to need the logic of scarcity and the logic of control. And that way, and that's the amazing thing, they sell at a lower price as the average market price. And they really provide food, not to a community of 250 people, but to thousands of thousands and thousands of people. So it's not outside the market. It's, it's being innovative and finding ways to kind of hack the logic of the market. And, 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 and I'll put another example. Is, uh, uh, at the beginning, I presented Wikispeed. So I really wonder what will be at the very end of Wikispeed, which is a, a wonderful project. The way it was produced, it was produced in a common way. But then, once the race car is there, what will happen with it? Will the purpose of selling it on the market trump the purpose of sharing this way of collectively producing modern products or the other way around? Okay. We don't know it. We cannot know. Can we break the logic of selling products on the market on a higher price to the logic of Let's contribute the resources, also the money we need, so that we can produce the way we want and control production. Particular, particularly since capital, uh, there was a terrific essay in the Wealth of the Commons book that Massimo De Angelis wrote called Does Capitalism Need a Commons Fix? And the idea is that the commons is performing all sorts of valuable functions, say pre-market development of products, which then it will appropriate and seize. I hope this is not the fate of WikiLeaks, uh, wiki speed uh, or WikiLeaks, actually. <laughs> uh, but the point is, if it's simply an open structure that doesn't protect itself, cannot replicate itself, it is simply feeding into the maw of the market machine. And, and that's why it's something very important to... But that's the situation where we are, actually, because I was told when we had our first briefing that I should also ask you a slightly difficult question. Uh, that is, uh, I see it as a very deeply symbiotic relationship, Michelle already hinted at it, between the digital commons and the leading multinational corporations. It's not just IBM funding Linux, it's Google, it's, uh, it's Apple. Apple is actually based on BSD. Yeah? So... Um, there we have the leading, most valuable, uh, in, in, in money terms, uh, 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 the biggest corporations, the leading, most modern corporations, and they're all taking from the commons. And they are giving, Google is giving back maybe a little bit, some of codes. Uh, Apple is giving back nothing, basically. And that's the mode of production that we have. And that's also now being expanded through things such as Open innovation is also using the commons uh, for generating new ideas. That's the paradigm. We are marching into it. And then this opening becomes a sort of a social dogma. Uh, you have to be good. You have to contribute to the commons. But that the commons will not pay your pension and not your health insurance. And that's the gap that's currently opening up. In the, in, the, in the wealthy societies. But you wanted to ask a difficult question. I think that's a difficult question, how to change that. <laughs> it will not be changed through some little open source oh, DIY it project. it's very difficult to change that. But I guess, I, or I think at least that was what, what we pointed at uh, to at, at your, for the talk, is that precisely transmit that message that it is crucial to protect the commons and to stick to the idea to produce and reproduce commons instead of commodities. That is the, is the, the answer to that question on a theoretical conceptual level. To say, or, or to put it bluntly, I think that for the commons as a movement, it is crucial if a project like Wikispeed or a project like, uh, or you have it, uh, Linux, etc., is concerned about protecting what they do and contribute to the commons as the commons. Or if they just say it's free for all and at some point we will convert it into money or at some point we will switch to social form. I think that 
that it is crucial that we engage into a discussion with those project leaders, that the idea of protecting the commons and reproducing the commons is the only way to get out of capital eating up commons we all contributed to. Okay, I've been seeing many hands waving. I would like to ask the lady there first at the back, or the gentleman next to her. Yes, I, I'm Philippe Grand. I'm, I'm a commoner, a writer, and, and a, an internet freedom uh, activist. Uh, I would like I would like to come back to the initial introductory talk because uh, though I, I, I sort of uh, agreed with quasi uh, uh, everything that was said. I'd, I had at the same time an uneasy feeling, uh, and the feeling comes from the fact that. At some point, when uh, uh, the common strategy group looks for what the commons have in common, yeah, uh, come into place a number of words like reciprocity uh, that have, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, that can be given a moral meaning, uh, and in the sense that, for example. Uh, if we don't ask ourselves reciprocity towards what? Uh, uh, that is, uh, most commons function with people contributing to the commons and people uh, uh, benefiting from the commons without transactional relationship between the two. Yeah? And if we start thinking of it as a kind of ethos of reciprocity that will bind the people together, that would uh, uh, constitute uh, 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 mutual obligations, then I believe we, we are going to re-import some of the aspects of uh, the medievalism uh, of which uh, Rodota spoke initially. That is the fact that moral obligations are oppressive. I mean, they, they require forms of enforcement uh, that, uh, that impose uh, uh, frames of behavior on people. And, of course, sometimes it is sort of necessary in the management of commons, but sometimes you can very much relax that. In, in, the, in the information commons, you do not have to care about what are the motivations of contributors. You have to care about them contributing, and in, not even always. Okay. So what I, what I would, uh, uh, let's say, is just, I would say, all these things are fine, but they must be handled with care. It's not just the markets that had violence. The, the commons themselves had oppressive properties that weakened them, uh, and made the market violence appealing to some. So it's, uh, I believe we have to be a bit careful about uh, wanting to impose too much on... Okay, I think we got the point. There were quite a few hands up. Actually, we will keep some statements. Yeah, please. F, F, you, yeah. Thank you. I'm uh, Hervé Le Cronier from France. Um, I, I think that the question uh, that the journalist asked is a very important one. Because, uh, David, when you talk about worker subjectivity uh, in, in the commons, I think we have to look at the way the cognitive capitalism is working. And it, it is working by asking everyone to give his whole subjectivity to the process of accumulating money. And there is an example that is very important is the Department of Defense in the United States will ask for everybody over the internet to build a new amphibian vehicle uh, with using crowdsourcing and every subjectivity. And what it has stake is that people want to give their knowledge. They, they want this. And we have to deal with this to create the new commons but the capitalism is also acting to deal with this, to deal with this people subjectivity to build new capitalism. And I think that uh, the question of the law is very important. As Michel remember, uh, we are in the same situation from the knowledge common that 
the worker movement was one century ago. But by, th by the process of the century, all the worker movement asked for protective law, and we have to ask for this to protect um, our commons. Just one example, and I will stop, is if we want to protect the knowledge command of university research, we, we have to deal with two things. First, to break the law just like the Beidol Act or, or the law that uh, help researcher to, uh, deep, to have patents. And the other action is um, to have enough money to guarantee independence of university. And for this, we have the big corporation to pay, to pay their uh, revenue uh, service. Uh, they have to pay taxes and for now, they don't pay that one. So they use the subjectivity of everyone and they don't pay to give back to the society the way to learn people, to, to educate people that can help them to get all their money. That's a very good point taken. Um, uh, the Asian lady there, please. Thank you. My name is Soma. I come from India and I work with marginalized communities specifically tribal and Dalit uh, communities uh, on issues of gender and livelihoods. And I'd like to thank Silke and David first for this very attractive presentation. It gives me a lot of uh, feel-good factor on the human values. And I'd love that to be the reality that we can move on to. But I'm trying to wrap my head around how that relates to the communities I work with. And I have a few dilemmas, which I hope that you can help me resolve. Um, no, seriously, because we have to look at uh, where we're coming from and the embeddedness of the ideas that we are trying to work with. So um, I'll have to keep putting on those specs. It's new to me. Um, in the subsistence economy, we find that there are deeply embedded hierarchies. And those hierarchies are not only at the level of, you know, the caste system and the class system, which we all talk about, but they're within communities. So there is no homogeneous community and there is no homogeneity within the family. So I'm trying to take the discourse into the domain of the household and what we call family as the unit of organizing production and production relations as well. And here we talk about... Um, issues of reciprocity and issues of, uh, I'm going back to your principles, uh, value, use value bring greater than exchange value and self-organizing and self-healing. To me, it seems much of this is being done by those most dependent on the materiality of, nat uh, of the natural commons. And uh, the others who are living off their labor, and that labor also becomes part of that material reality that helps to produce uh, the kind of uh, commodities, or if we'd like to see that also moving away from commodities to common goods, that others are using, but they seldom get benefit of. The point I'm making is that in the marginalized households, it is the women who are the caring, the nurturing, in the relational economy where they do all the work, the self-organizing and the self-healing and never get the treatments when they're needed, never get the goods when they're needed, the men exercise the option of migrating out for work out of compulsion in their own regions when there isn't enough to eat, but they can exercise that choice because the women are there to do the nurturing, to do the processing and do the feeding when a family is at a level of survival. So how do we see this moving forward in a way that we can actually engage with these communities in a way that the commons has meaning and brings a better level of well-being? And I love the way our friends, um, the speaker from Bolivia mentioned that sense of being, of feeling well, of being of having more than well-being, I think the way she stated it was so eloquent, that there is more to life than just the sense of material well-being. And that, within, that needs to start from the household. So my other question was really about the spatiality, where we have fractured uh, experiences, even within the household, how do we embed such a reality? And I really do look for answers to that so that we can take this 
into a realm of engaging strategically with our communities? Those are certainly not easy questions. Uh, I wonder if we can answer them now. I generally want a little bit about time keeping. Luckily, we have the president here. Um, it's <laughs> nine o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> um, how long are we going to, because it, it, it affects a little bit the op, uh, operating mode. Because, I mean, because the good thing is that we have a get-together down there. So can this the good thing is that we have to uh, get together after this, this session down there and that we can continue talking with each other to each other even in a more pluralistic and diverse way. So I, wh why not take two more, give us... A last word here. I think, yeah, maybe. I think actually, I think... Uh, enough. <laughs> I think let's have a few more comments. Maybe comments, questions, radical Two opinions. Maybe we'll uh, make one last bit, round. Maybe uh, here, uh, this gentleman with the moustache. I have uh, two questions. Uh, I'll try to be very brief. I'm sorry. I'm Burns Weston. I'm a professor of international law uh, from the United States. I specialize in human rights. I'm also co-founder with David Bowyer of the Commons Law Project. Um, and uh, it's really out of both of these activities that I have my, my two questions. I've not heard in this discussion, uh, I'm extremely taken by uh, what you uh, said, um, but I've not heard in this discussion any reference to human rights, except perhaps at one point you did allude to it, but it certainly wasn't a central theme. Um, and as far as I know, um, as for so long as there has ever been human societies, uh, s almost any form of social organization can become corrupt, uh, can be regressive, uh, can be, um, how shall we put it, anti-commons. Um, and I don't see why commons would be any exception. There's nothing built into the notion of the commons except the fact that it is very much a people-to-people -people kind of thing. Um, but what are the guarantees against the commons going sour, uh, even at the local level? Uh, and it seems to me that, that it's very important that any commons, whether it's ecologically based, whether it's the Internet, whatever it is, must have at its very core some kind of a rights-based uh, regulatory system. And I'm not talking about human rights the way m the major powers use it to excuse all kinds of escapades that they engage in. Uh, but I think it's very, very important that that be added to this uh, discourse that you have uh, initiated today. My second question is, it's very, very easy, despite all the problems we have at the local level, even with just heavens, even my own family, uh, in trying to, you know, make things work. Um, but uh, it's easy for me in general, in principle, to understand what you said about the various principles that you would have operating insofar as we're talking about relative, relatively localized commons. You did mention the Great Lakes Commons adventure, excuse me, venture, uh, with which I have enormous, for which I have enormous respect and think it's very much needed. But beyond that, what about the atmosphere? What about the oceans? What about major deserts? What about prairies, uh, what about glaciers, glacial systems? I am, of course, being very ecologically oriented here. That happens to be a recent concern of mine. Um, but how do you translate what you've said to the higher level? You mentioned, uh, you brought up the notion of scaling up. I thought you were going to be talking 
about scaling up to a larger kind of ecosystemic uh, uh, context that, that appears that's not where you were headed, but maybe I misunderstood you. But I'd like a response both to the rights part of my question and to the largeness of an ecosystem or resource question on how these principles apply. I think maybe we could like wrap that into a final statement by each the response to that. Yeah. Um, well, uh, a, a few a few comments first to to Soma from India. Um, I want to be very clear on that point that. I didn't think that whatever is community-based is a commons and that in commons uh, in communities there are no hierarchies. I think that we should not conflate the idea that community-based is commons. They are two different things. If we really see the commons as a social process, as a way people relate to each other through a process of commoning as they manage shared resources, being them, water, knowledge, and Usually it's water and knowledge, it's both. Um, producing two things, relationships, social relationships constantly as part of that process, and products, which was the part we focused on. And, and, and then that means that a commons is where all those things are together. That is why we have to figure out, and this was just the first approach, I mean, who has, ha who has done research on the principles and patterns of commoning out there? I, there is Franz Narada, who has done a bit, but he's not even here because uh, he has to attend other commons projects, etc. So we, we, we need to figure out how it actually works at this level. And um, this, is, this is one first point. Whatever is commons, uh, community based is not a commons. But how can we strengthen the principles of commoning within a community or network or user group controlled something? The second point is, and I want to remind, and that actually it just comes to my mind that I didn't know uh, why we, we did not mention so far Elino Ostrom, the grand dame of commons research as well. But I just reminded one of her uh, very strong sentences, which is that um, it's not about a tragedy of the commons. It's, it's the drama of the commons. That means building a commons and doing commoning and defending commoning means struggle, conflict, dealing with complexity, dealing with the very fact that there are no simple answers dealing with the idea that there's no blueprint. And that is precisely what makes us seemingly weaker than those who seem to have a blueprint. But the price of that, we paid all together, right, for that market fundamentalist blueprint. And the last idea is, I think that, yes, in a way, we address that issue of scaling up challenging the very idea of scaling up. Because if I, for instance, see that one of the most promising proposals in terms of inscribing common principles into an international governance regime as related to the atmosphere, which is the Yasuni ITT initiative from Ecuador, which was, I know all of its flaws, but which was an interna international governance proposal which had really a chance to be uh, uh, applied, and politicians just stopped it. There was no interest in it, and I don't think, I don't think at all that this is a matter of law, because the institutions were there, the legal framework was there. It was not a legal problem. It was not an institutional problem at all. It was a problem of a mindset. Exactly. And I think it's, it's about political will. But how will you convince somebody that she should, he should politically push the commons if he does not, and not even understand the idea? And if his mindset is so different? 
So that is why I think that one of our big challenges is really to switch the concepts and the mindset and to make these principles of governing visible to the whole world. And yes, we can as an em uh, emphasis and as an attitude also change the world. Well, there is a number of questions that could go on for a long time. I'm going to try to touch a few of them. Uh, I'm trying to keep them all in my head at the same time. Um, I think there's a paradoxical relationship between the, inst the legal institutions we create and the social, as I was saying, subjectivity that we bring to it. I think Philippe was quite right to raise the question of we need to deal with this subtly uh, because different circumstances <laughs> play in different ways. But there, I don't know how many legal institutions we may have that may nominally give us a right, which is a dead husk because the social culture does not support it. And similarly, the highly subjective communities that can be oppressive, uh, as, as he pointed out, through moral obligation. So I, I think there's a risk in us getting to one pole or the other, and this is a constant iterative conversation between our legal forms and structures and uh, our social subjectivities as we engage with them. But Burns is quite right to raise human rights as an issue to the extent that it speaks to subsistence, everyday needs, dignity, and other elemental aspects of what I think the commons is all about. And within, the, I think part of the challenge is, as uh, Stefano Rodata was pointing out, was how within the existing system of the nation state and constitutional, liberal constitutionalism, we can build makeshift, workable legal structures that recognize the commons and can empower them uh, as a matter of law. So they're not simply an aggregation of, uh, of uh, isolated commons without recognition by conventional law. I think that's a complicated challenge we face. Uh, Burns and I have produced a, a draft covenant that tries to address uh, the the uh, rights-based approach to uh, to the clean environment and to the commons as a basic human right. Uh, so I think this is part of a conversation we have to begin, as, as Stefano did, uh, to how the law and institutions can enable but not simply become dead husks that don't live with the vitality of our social engagement with it. Yes, well... Um no, the, the question by Soma is very challenging, and uh, I think the honest answer is that we don't know. But I think the important thing is that peer-producing, commons-producing communities are creative communities. So they are facing all kinds of problems, all kinds of obstacles, all kinds of attacks, and they are experimenting with solutions. So it's very important that we start observing what is actually happening in these communities, how they are solving uh, these issues, and I'm sure the same is happening, uh, you know, in other regions of the world. There, uh, I think the problem is uh, a problem of communication. And it's one of the things that the P2P Foundation aims to do is to create these transversal links between uh, projects. Because, you know, I could speak hours seriously about social innovations that are happening in that space, which are changing the lives of hundreds of thousands of people for the good, and but nobody knows about it. So there's another question about scaling up is that we have to recreate a fabric of communication. That's why we're here. You know, not because anybody has a particular answer for everything, but if we scale down the problems to a manageable level, we can see that communities have dealt with them and have found solutions. And for example, on the issue of governance and ownership, you know, you look at the free software world, well we, we know there is now an institutional reality where the communities have chosen mostly for technocratic and meritocratic uh, control systems which protect the integrity of the project and they've created democratic foundations with elections and, and everything else that defend the project from the outside. And just through observation, we can see that things are happening and that people are actually creating something new. And you know, in the big revolutions, the French Revolution or whatever, if you actually look at the history, they were all preceded by these social innovations. It's, it's not the other way around. It's not, you know, people take power and then they change everything afterwards. It's m people were changing their lives and 
were increasingly frustrated that the, uh, the political system didn't reflect uh, their new values and their new desires. And this is, I think, the stage we are in where people are actually changing uh, their lives and we have to know what they're doing, how they're doing it, and learn from each other. And I think that's the only way, actually, to, to have an answer. So, thank you. I would also like to uh, take the opportunity to say three things very quickly. Um, first of all, um, I, I think I'm getting a bit old because uh, sometimes uh, when I hear commons, commoners, communists, uh, there seem to, that seems to be like the elephant in the room not to be talked about because it is the same word, it has the same roots. So there seems to be a fear of being sort of put into the same box or category. That's just one observation I have. The second observation is that sometimes, especially when there is talk about the digital commons, I'm afraid the digital commons as a vision sounds like the latest form of Western-centric universalism. And the third thing that I want to say is free, as in free beer, is gravely underrated. So let's have some, maybe. 